that ready. If you're a first time guest or newer, please don't feel obligated uh, to give at all. We actually have a gift for you outside. Um, so today we are kicking off a new series called I Am, and Ron's going to be talking about I am who God says I am. So it probably has to do with a trash can up here because he has this and some VHS. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, let's do Cheech and Chong. What? No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> it says gospel music. So he's going to kind of tie that all in together. Hey, it ties in with the blockbuster thing I said last week too, right? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So he's going to go ahead and make his way out. While he's doing that, will you get out your teaching notes and the humility chart? You're going to need that um, with Ron's sermon today. Thank Sorry. you, Diva. Yeah, I had to just throw that one in. VHS. Cheech and Chong. What's this? So fun. Hey, good morning, everybody. As uh, David just said, if you're brand new, my name is Ron, and I'm part of the teaching team here at New Life, and I love to teach, and rarely do I get as excited as I am to be able to share with you what I'm going to share with you today. So, but it is going to demand that you listen fast, okay? I want to say a couple things on the way in. Every Sunday morning at New Life, we, we really work on two things. I mean, lots more than two. But every Sunday morning is a morning of hope. And, and the reason it's a morning of hope is because one of the things that we've learned about God is that he loves us just as we are. He accepts us just as we are. And then he says, would you let me take you by the hand and take you to a better place in your life? He's not behind you driving you. He doesn't hand you a manual and say, read this, obey it, and your life will get better. He's a father. He takes us by the hand. We're going to watch this this morning in the life of one of the characters in the Bible, how God takes this guy who is a coward, and he takes him by the hand, and by the time God gets done with him, he is crazy courageous. How does that happen? So two things, hope and learning. And so are you ready to learn? Amen. Yep. All right, here we go. Uh, we are kicking off a brand new series called I Am. And uh, as you can tell, it's about identity. And we're going to dig way into what I, that identity might look like. And so just to begin, if you'll take that blank sheet of teaching notes and I have a little exercise. J just write, I am, and then fill in the blank afterwards. Now, I have to give you a couple of caveats. Don't put down a role that you fulfill in life. Because you are not a supervisor, okay? I happen to be a pastor, but that's not who I am. That's what I do. You understand? So if you could back up from your life and take a snapshot, what would be the dominant characteristics that form who you are at the core of your being? Just write down one or two. It's not right or wrong. It's just something to get your mind thinking. Because what we're really asking is, who or what am I at the core of my being? And that is actually harder to do than it might sound. Sometimes people around us have better insight into that than what we do, right? So I was watching a movie the other day, and in the movie, um, one, of the, one of the people in the movie was having a really difficult time making up her mind about something, and she had a friend, and the friend said to her, why don't you flip a coin? And she said, I'm going to make the most important decision of my life by flipping a coin? Are you kidding me? That's crazy. And the friend said, no, it's not. So you have two things, and you really don't know what to do. You flip a coin, and when the coin is in the air, whatever you secretly hope it lands on, that's where your heart is. Ha! Huh. Life works that way, only it's not with a flip of a coin. What are the narratives about myself that actually play in my head 
when life is tough. You ever have the narrative, here I go again? This is the way it always is with me. Worse yet, this is what my dad always said of me. This is what some playground bully said of me. These are VHS tapes for those of you who are under 25. <laughs> this actually captures scenes, movie scenes, okay? And you used to be able to put these in a machine and it would play on your TV. Yeah, that's right, witchcraft, all right. I chose VHS for a reason. And that's because many of the tapes that play in our minds are that old school. They're tapes that got recorded when we were a kid. They're tapes of an aunt who has long died. They're tapes of, some, I was visiting with somebody just the other day and they said to me, I can hear my grandfather's voice as crystal clear as if it were yesterday. And this is what he said about me. You know what they did? They got the tape of their grandfather's voice. They plugged it in the, in the, the VHS machine in their head and they played it. So if you want to know kind of what's really down in here, when life gets tough, what are the narratives that float to the surface? Because those are the things that we want to talk about. You see, <clears throat> here's a tree. Everybody wants wonderful leaves and wonderful fruit. And, and, and we work on that all the time because this is the part of the tree that everybody sees. And this is the part of the tree that everybody draws their opinions about us from because this is what they can see. And what we're really afraid of is as they look at this, what judgment will they have of us? But every gardener knows that if you want this to be healthy, you got to work on this. Yeah, because the truth is healthy fruit requires healthy roots. You won't get one without the other. And so we're actually going to work in this teaching series on the roots. What are these narratives that play in our heads? And I want to start with just a concept that I want to lay out for us. And here it is, the healthiest, strongest, and most productive, and most resilient trees have their roots embedded deeply in the rich and nourishing soil of humility. How's that for short and concise? <laughs> I'm going to give you the more concise version in a minute. But I don't want you to miss this. Do you want your life to be healthy? Of course you do. Do you want to be strong? Yeah, sure you do. Do you want to be productive? Of course you do. Do you want to be resilient when life hits you hard? More than any other virtue that you could name, more than any other characteristic that you could have in your life or choose, I think it's clear from a study of scripture, from a study of the life of Jesus, from a study of what God says, that if you want those things to be true of your life, you're going to have to sink your roots deeply into the soil of humility. But I want to tell you, for most people, humility is scary. And it's the last thing we'd want to sink our roots into, kind of. We would like to be known as humble, but we're not sure we want to be that. Because I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding of what humility is. But I can assure you, once you understand what the real nature of humility is, you will find that it is rich and it's nourishing. It's phenomenal. Humility is the key to enduring an unshakable strength. It just is. More than any other characteristic you could name. But this is where we have to understand what humility is. So I'm going to give you a definition of humility that Merriam-Webster will not give you. Okay? Dictionary.com will not give you this one either. 
I'm going to give you a definition that I think comes straight from Scripture, and here it is. And if you're taking notes, this is what you want to write down, okay? Here it is. Humility is agreeing with God about who I am. Not who people are, that's good to know, but who I am individually. And that's why we're starting with a teaching that is, I am who God says I am. So how does that work? We're going to dig into the nature of humility, and we're going to build a chart. So here's the first leg of the chart. It's the strength and confidence chart. So if you want to be confident in life, and you want to be strong in life and resilient and so forth, most of us are, t are taught that you start on the self-reliance scale, on this continuum. And the interesting thing about living in the world of self-reliance is the first thing we notice is that it puts us in competition with everybody else. Because after all, if I'm going to feel confident, I need to feel like that I'm doing a better job of life than the people around me. But as soon as you bring in somebody who's doing way better than I am, all of a sudden, I don't feel so good. So let's just put it in the field of money. And let's just say I'm a millionaire. And I think, by golly, not too many people get to be millionaires. I am a very blessed guy. I've worked really hard. I've earned this. I've made good decisions. I've hired good people. I've made good choices along the way. And I have become a millionaire. And that's something I can be proud of. And I feel really good. And I can talk to all kinds of people until Warren Buffett walks in the room. And then I go take my seat. Because that's what self-reliance does. That's true in the field of beauty. It's true in the field of intellectual abilities. It's true in the field of art, in music. It's true in every field. When we get on the continuum of self-reliance, it has sort of two things. And let's go all the way out to this extreme. If I'm really, really, really good at what I do and everybody builds me up, it's very easy for me to become arrogant and cocky, and self-confident, and self-reliant. Why? Because I feel like I'm a self-made person. That's right. And if everybody worked as hard as I do, and dreamed as big as I do, and applied themselves the way that I do, they could all do this too. Do you ever hear that message on TV? All the time. But you know what? The end result of that is actually fragile. Have you ever heard the statement, egos are what? Fragile. They break very easily. They're really, 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 really strong until something crashes and all of a sudden they're in a pile of pieces because, well, ego is fragile. Fragile, I would call it a strength imposter. It's really, really strong for a while. But when it comes up against something bigger than it, it crashes and crumbles. That's why it's fragile. So we say, well, let's not go on that end of the scale. Let's go out on this end of the scale. So on this end of the scale, we have insecurity. Over here, we have arrogance. Over here, we have insecurity. And insecurity is this thing that tells me I'm not enough. This thing tells me, as a friend of mine once said, I'm all that and a bag of chips more. This says, I'm a bag of chips short. Yeah, I'm not enough. And when I, when I have this basic sense of insecurity, I will tend to form relationships of codependence. Where now, in order for me to feel good about myself, other people around me have to come in and help me out and make up where I'm weak, and they have to feel good about me, because if they don't feel good about me, I can't feel good about myself. And I'm now codependent. Some of you are married to people that you're codependent to. I don't say that to shame you. I say that because in order to be a better spouse, you have to understand what it means to have your identity set in the wrong space. I know it makes wonderful love songs. Baby, I can't live without you. <laughs> Please don't marry me to somebody like that. I'm dragging an anchor through life. 
that can't get along without me. Do I want my wife to, to want to be with me? Yes, but not because she couldn't survive without me. A relationship of codependence. And guess what? That makes me weak. So here's the interesting thing. We've got arrogance, a self-made sense of being self-made, and fragility on this side. We've got insecurity, codependency, and weakness on this side. And guess what we have been taught most of our lives? That if we could somehow get in the middle and not be too arrogant and not be too insecure, that this is the humility zone. Now just think with me logically for a minute. On this continuum, we have being fragile, and being weak. And who among us would think if you got just the right amount of fragility and just the right amount of insecurity and weakness and you combined them, you would have this strength? That's crazy. That's crazy. And yet we're taught, don't be too arrogant and don't be too insecure. And somehow if you could keep those in balance, that's where you would find the strength and humility. And I would like to say to you, it's not on that scale anywhere. The only thing you will find on this is differing degrees of weakness and, and fragility. But there is a different continuum. And this is the one that God calls us to. And this is the one that actually gives us hope. So what if humility isn't holding two opposing poles in balance, but a commodity all of its own, and it's found on a completely different continuum, and here it is, the continuum of faith. By the way, what's the title of this? I am who what? God says I am. You might expect to find that answer on the continuum of faith, correct? Of course, because it has to do with God. And the interesting thing about being on the continuum of faith is this. It puts us in natural partnership with God and the people around us because I no longer have to, what shall I say, elbow my space and make sure people know who I really am. It allows me to be vulnerable. One of my favorite passages and stories in all the Bible, I don't have time to read to you this morning, but if you want to write down a scripture reference and go read it, Here's the scripture reference, John chapter 13. And it's the story of Jesus washing the feet of his 12 closest followers. And if you read the beginning of that story, you will understand because Jesus knew who he was. He knew where he had come from and he knew where he was going. It enabled him to act with a humility that no one else in the room could. And it's just that simple when you read it. So, what about this continuum of faith? The interesting thing is, the longer you stay on this, on this continuum, you end up with this growing sense there it is, of humility. A growing sense of humility, an understanding of who I am, an understanding of who God says I am, and not just that I'm his child, but that God says, look, I wired you with these abilities and these strengths. And I've wired you with these capacities and resources in your life. And one of the greatest things you could do is own them. Don't apologize for them. Own them. And then use them selflessly. And when you own all of who God made you to be and you use it selflessly to bless people around you, you, my friend, are humble strong. That's how humility is supposed to work. It puts us in a position of trust where I can trust God, what God says about me. And when I can trust what God says about me, it makes me really, really strong. Because when I know what God says about me, you might say anything you want about me. But if I know who I am, because God told me who I am, as much as I love you, what you say about me negatively would just fall off. 
I'll be sorry that you choose to think that about me. I'll be disappointed, but it won't shake me because I know who I am. Now we're going to watch God give a humility coaching lesson to a guy in the Bible. And I love this story. Okay. So in order to understand this story, we got to go all the way back to the history of ancient Israel. And one of their chief enemies was a group of people called the Midianites. And there, there was a period of time in ancient Israeli history where they had forsaken God and forgot all about God. And they decided to be a pagan like everybody else and worship idols and all that kind of stuff. And so God allowed the Midianites to conquer them. And not only did they lose the war, but the Midianites were pretty sharp people. They said, you know what? Why should we spend all of our time raising crops and doing all those things when we can let the Israelites do it and then at harvest time, we'll just go raid their country and take their crops? Well, not good. So that's what they did. Now that made that a little tough on the Israelites, don't you think? Yeah. So it's in the middle of that. And this was happening several years in a row. That we find the central character in the story, a guy by the name of Gideon, and he's hiding. Because it's harvest time. And he knows the Midianites are coming. And he beat them to the punch. He went out and harvested his own grain before the Midianites got there. And he took it. And he put all of his grain in a wine press, not where you would usually store grain. That's where you, wine presses were carved out of solid rock. You put all the grapes in there, you stomped on the grapes, and the wine press was made where it had a little hole in the bottom and another little hollow spot down there where you could put a container and all the juice from the grapes will go through the little hole in the container below. And a wine press was big. You could hide in it. So Gideon puts all of his grain down in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites, but he has a little problem. The grain has all the hull on the outside, and he has to somehow get the hull off. Now, usually they took an ox and had the ox walk on the grain because the weight of the ox and, and the ox's hooves would actually break the hull from the, from the kernel of the wheat. But Gideon can't put an ox in a wine press. He could get him in, but he's not getting him out, right? So he's got a problem. So you know what Gideon is doing? He's down there pretending to be an ox. He's got his grain down there and he's stomping on the grain. I don't know if he put wood on the bottom of his shoes. I don't know, but he's down there hiding from the Midianites and trying to salvage some grain. And that's when God shows up. And here's what God says. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Hello. <laughs> That's not exactly where we would start. You know what God is saying? This is what I want you to get. God is saying to Gideon, look, you're a mighty warrior. I know you're not acting like one right now. But I made you. And I put a mighty warrior inside you. He's in there. Huh. Gideon gets out his tape of what he's been told about himself and what he believes about himself and what he believes about God. And he starts to play the tape. Here it is. Gideon replied, with me, my master? You just said God's with me. Are you kidding me? Where do you think I am? If God was with me, would I be hiding down here? He goes on to say, if God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about, telling us, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, Gideon's talking to an angel. I love Gideon. Hey, dude. The fact is this, God has nothing to do with us. In fact, he has turned us over to Midian. 
Wow, was that a strong tape? Pretty strong. Yeah. So does God argue? Nope. This is a humility coaching lesson. It's not about guilt. This is about God rewriting Gideon's tapes and rewriting them with the truth. Gideon, you actually are who I say you are. Now, I've called you a mighty warrior. God goes on. I love this. God faced him directly. You ever have a parent or a teacher take your face <laughs> and look you right in the eye? This is God doing this with Gideon. Hey, dude, listen up. I have a message for you. Here it is. Go in the strength that is yours. Oh, my goodness. You know what God is saying? Gideon, on the inside of you, there is a huge bundle of strength. I know. I put it there. It comes in combination with that mighty warrior. I already told you was inside you. Go in the strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I sent you? He ended up the first one by saying, I am with you. He ends up the second part of this coaching session by saying, haven't I sent you? So how will Gideon respond to this? Gideon gets out a different tape. This is the tape of what he thinks about God and the questions he has. This is the tape of what he's been told about himself. And he plays it so God can see it. Here it is. Gideon said to him, me, my master. By the way, did you notice both times he starts with me, my master? You know what he's really saying? A dude, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. I'm not your man. And then he goes on to say, how and with what could I ever save Israel? Are you kidding me? Look at me. <laughs> Where am I? What am I doing? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the runt of the litter. Do you think he'd ever heard that before? Oh, yeah. That tape was crystal clear in his mind. I can never do that. God said to him, here it is, I'll be with you. Believe me. Do you remember? Let's go all the way back, and I apologize for doing this, but we're going to go all the way back to this. Gideon is living life on the self-reliant scale. Who am I? I'm, my family is the least in the tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the runt of the litter. He's down on the self-reliant scale. He's, God says, go and deliver. Oh, no, I could never do that. Why? Because I have all these questions. I'm pretty sure God's not with us, so it's just up to us. He's down on the self-reliant scale. And God is continually saying, Gideon, I'll be with you. I'm sending you. I'll be with you. Come on, Gideon, get on the faith scale. Because you'll never find humility and strength on this one. You have to get on this one to really find that. So now, fast forwarding to where we were, what does Gideon do? He finally gets it. He finally gets it. And you know what? Skipping through a whole bunch of stuff in the middle where God does more identity setting with him, Gideon finally goes out, and here's what he does. With an army of just 300 men, he faced and defeated an army of more than 300. 100,000 people. What are the odds? Not very good. There are a thousand to one that he's going to fail. Yeah. And yet, he wins. You know what else? How would you like this job? You're going to go and you're going to stand in front of 299 other people, and you're going to tell them, God talked to me and said, we're going to win. <laughs> huh. Can I share with you that when you tap into 
the person that God made you to be. And you stand in the fullness of who you are and what God is calling you to do. And you do it in a posture of surrender and selflessness. You inspire people around you to become all that God wired them up to be. Does that make sense? And those 299 men got together with Gideon and they said, let's go do this. Huh. You see, true humility isn't thinking less of me. It's actually embracing all of me in a posture of surrender and selflessness. So I have a forward resolve. And by the way, God, oh my goodness, early on in life, when I was a young pastor, I, I, I went to see a counselor and the counselor gave me a test that measured that sort of self-reliance thing. And it measured it on a scale of zero to 99, right? Zero meaning, meaning I had no self-confidence, was really insecure, and was perfectly set up to form relationships of codependence and weakness. 99 means I could be arrogant and self-made and self-confident and all that stuff. I scored a zero. True. I scored a zero. And over the years, God called me to a different continuum. And he said, Ron, this is my job for you. This is what I've put inside you. This is what I've wired inside you. Come and take this journey with me. But always remember, I could take anybody on this journey. It's not about you. But be grateful it gets to be you. That's what God wants for you that you would know all of who you are, that you would and could embrace all of who you are. And you could stand in that reality and when people criticize you for doing what you're doing or being what you're being, that instead of taking that all personally and second guessing yourself and going through all that misery and stuff that sometimes we do, that you could stand humbly in that space. And let that fall away because you know who you are and you know what you've been called to do and you would never apologize for that. So here's my forward resolve. From this day forward, I will let only God define me. I won't let my mom define me. I won't let my dad define me. I won't let the bully on the playground that I played with 40 years ago define me. I won't let my current boss define me. I won't let my worst deeds define me. I won't let my struggles define me. I won't let anything or anybody but God define me. And then I can be humble strong. BTT, okay? When I was a kid, youth pastors talked about three things, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And they all considered them the same. And they would every once in a while stand up and give us this big, big challenge. If you want to be serious about Jesus, one of the things you got to do is you got to take all your rock and roll tapes and you got to go out and put them in a big pile and you got to light them and burn them up as a symbol. You're done with rock and roll. Please, I don't buy into that anymore, okay? Just want you to know that was my background, all right? We weren't too green conscious because the odor and the smoke that came from that stuff... <laughs> Was, was not good, trust me, all right? Um, so what does God want to do with you and me? Well, I can tell you what he wants you to do with the tapes. He puts it very clearly, and let me finish by reading this passage. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Now, oftentimes we think of that in terms of just straight-up behaviors, 
But there's a translation of this that says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And it could easily be saying this, don't allow the world to define you. Don't buy into that mindset of competition, of self-reliance of comparing yourself with how well you're doing compared to other people or how badly you're doing compared to other people. Don't let the world give you that kind of thought process. But instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing what? The way you think. By changing the way you think about yourself. Then you will learn And you will come to know what God's will actually is. Because you'll be on the right continuum. Because God can then talk to you clearly. So, when something happens and one of those old narrative surfaces in your mind and you hear a tape playing in your head, That's where it goes. You get rid of it. And you say, God, give me a new tape for that. What's the truth about me? Could be a bully, could be your parents. Next time something happens, a different narrative will come up. You know what to do with it. You throw it in the trash and you say, God, give me a new narrative. Let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think. And eventually, the tape of God will be what plays in your head. And you will know who you are. And then you can act with amazing strength. The the band is going to come and play a song that actually we could have just had them play at the beginning and you could have gone home. You would have gotten the whole message, all right? This is, this teaching in the lyrics of a single song, I want you to just sit and listen and soak. God, as the band prepares, would you open our hearts and would you help us to have a resolve that says from this day forward, only you will I ever give the privilege of defining me. I pray it in your name. Amen.
fall free.